Welcome everybody. Today we're out here at my family's farm. My name is Stephen Filter. I'm a fourth generation farmer here in Live Oak, California. We're located about an hour north of Sacramento, uh, just right off Highway 99, and we farm peaches, prunes, and walnuts. Uh, we also have a large custom harvesting operation during walnuts where we harvest other customers' crops, bring them in, hull them, dry them, and ship them to the processor. Uh, when I say I'm a fourth generation farmer, I mean that we've been farming this property for over 120 years now. My great grandfather immigrated from Germany and settled here, growing various crops, which turned into peaches, prunes, and walnuts that we grow today. Um, a fun fact, actually, about my family is our last name actually started with the letter V. And when he emigrated through Ellis Island in his thick German accent, it sounded like filter. And that's how we became the filters. So today we, we farm about a thousand acres here. Uh, we're in Sutter County, right next to the Feather River on some of the best soil in California. Um, we're very lucky to have good water here. Um, even with a drought, we use conservation techniques, but we're still able to farm to our full acreage potential. Uh, today we're gonna be doing a little bit of everything. We're gonna walk from the walnuts that we're in here right now. Uh, we're gonna talk about what's going on in the orchards today. We're gonna go visit one of the peach orchards where we're actually thinning the fruit, um, which is our next step before we get to harvest, which is just a couple of months away. Um, after that, we'll go to one of our prune orchards and actually see those being thinned by machine versus the peaches being thinned by hand. Then we'll take a quick jaunt up the road and visit our local SunSweet dryer where all of our prunes are delivered during harvest. And that's where they become an actual prune from a plum. And we'll talk more about that a little later. Other than that, we'll also visit the Feather River and see how the drought is currently impacting our farm. Okay, so let's talk about where we're at right now. So we're in a walnut orchard. This is about a 25 year old orchard. So it was planted when I was really young. Um, it's Chandler's, which is the most popular variety of walnuts here grown here in California. Um, this orchard is also very close to our home operations. So our processing plant is right here next door and these walnuts will only go about 100 yards before they're shipped to a store near you. So what's going on in the orchard today? Um, right now, we are just keeping everything growing until harvest. We're kind of in that maintenance mode, giving the trees exactly what they need. The walnut trees are a lot like us, and same with the peaches and prunes. They need water, they need to stay hydrated, they need food, so we give them different amendments, different fertilizers to keep them growing healthy. And they also need to just have the right environment to grow in. Unfortunately, as farmers, we don't really have that opportunity to control the wind or the rain. Um, but luckily so far this year, we've lucked out. Um, haven't had any big problems with mother nature and she's actually been on our side a little bit. Um, so let's talk about exactly what's going on with the walnuts right now. Um, so let me grab one off the tree here. And I can actually show you what a walnut looks like today. So while that doesn't look like what you would see in the grocery store, the walnut is actually growing inside this green hole. And if I cut one open, Put it in the shade. you can actually see the little walnut meats growing in there. So those will continue to grow until about mid-September uh, where we'll come through and harvest. At that time, this green outer shell called the hole will actually dry up and fall off and we'll know it's time to pick. So besides that, let's talk about a couple things that are special to this orchard. Like I said, it's about 25 years old and was planted when I was very young. So one of the unique things about this orchard, like, and also like a lot of other walnut orchards, is the trees are actually grafted. So you can see here on the tree that as you get down toward the soil, the bottom part is actually a different material, different like uh, texture of bark. So it's a little bit rougher and a little darker color. It's because when the tree was actually grown in the nursery, the top part of the root stock, the, the rough part down at the bottom, was cut off and the Chandler variety was grafted onto the top. And so that gave us the exact variety we want and gave us the characteristics of the crop that we want, but also provided us with the roots that we desired for this type of soil. So these roots are disease resistant, but also work very good in our loamy soil and take up water very well. 
Okay, so like I mentioned throughout the year, we have to make sure the trees have plenty of water. So while there's other different ways to irrigate your orchard, um, some orchards are still flood irrigated where the water is just spread across on the top, kind of like you're flooding a, a new lake or new pond. Here, we irrigate solely by microjet sprinklers. And so you can see this orchard is being irrigated right now. Um, we run the water anywhere from 24 to 36 hours, depending on how deep the water goes. So now with new technologies, we actually monitor all of this on our phones or our computers in the office and can actually tell using electronic moisture probes where that water is reaching in the soil profile. But we used to always just do it manually using a soil probe like you see here. And so how we would do that is every day, about every 12 hours of irrigation running, we'd come out and walk to multiple spots out in the orchard. We would simply take this, push it down into the ground. That's about the length of a foot. We would pull it out and see what the, the soil actually looked like. Here you can see this one's been running since about, oh, probably about 24 hours ago. And so it's plenty wet in that first top foot. So we would go down to about 36 inches and see where our water was at. 36 inches is about the general depth that a walnut root would get. So we're making sure that we're using enough water to fully supply the tree, but we're not filling any of the ground beneath the root structure. That way we're conserving as much water as we can. We also, throughout the year, we'll use these soil probes to take soil samples. And so we'll go out to the orchards and go, like I said, to various locations and take samples of the soil and actually send them to an analytical lab. That lab tells us the exact nutrient content that is available in the soil for the trees at that time. That lets us tailor our fertilizer and our other soil amendments to be perfect for what that orchard needs. So while we're talking about irrigating our walnuts, I wanted to point out a structure here on the farm. You'll see a lot of these right off the side of, of the roads around different orchards. So this is actually where we're getting the water for that orchard. This is a, a deep water well this here is actually our electric pump that's pulling it out of the ground and various filters which helps us provide the clean water to the sprinklers and also we're able to monitor exactly how much groundwater we're pulling up and putting on our trees. That helps us over time monitor to make sure there's no trends in the amount of water we're putting out and also make sure that our well and aquifer is still healthy. Okay, so now we're out here at one of my family's peach orchards. So this is actually our earliest variety. This, this peach orchard will be ready and ready for harvest about the second week of July. So about 70 days from now, we'll actually be picking this orchard. So today we're going through one of the important processes of growing peaches, and that's actually thinning the fruit. So as you can see in the background here, Juan is going through the tree by hand and pulling off a lot of fruit so that we make sure we have the exact amount that we need on the tree. So for this orchard, we're shooting for about 800 to 850 peaches per tree. So while it looks like we're wasting a lot of fruit, there's more, many reasons why we thin. So one of the reasons we thin is the tree has a set amount of energy every year. It can only put so much energy into fruit production. So instead of doing over 2,000 maybe say peaches that are very small and not, not as good of peaches that want to go to market, we, we thin the tree down so that we produce nice sized fruit with all of that energy. While it looks like those peaches on the ground are being wasted, the carbon, the nitrogen, the other micronutrients that make up those fruit are actually just being recycled back into the soil. So as we irrigate, mow, and take care of the orchard, those nutrients will be sucked back down into the roots and probably end up into one of these peaches. As you can see, when you thin, you will go through each tree and break up the bunches to get the right spacing you want on the limb. That allows the peaches to grow very big and also doesn't stress the tree out by putting too much weight on a single branch. That allows this orchard to continue producing for nearly 20 years. Over here you can see a tree that hasn't been thinned yet and you can see how much fruit is on there. They're almost clustered together like grapes. So you can imagine if you had that many peaches the size of my fist on that one little branch, you definitely have a lot of problems. We go through each branch by hand and we'll pull off the fruit. You can see where different peaches were pulled off here to give you about a fist spacing between each peach. 
As we work through, we like to visualize each peach being about the size of your fist at harvest. So you can see here that these peaches would have plenty of space to grow to full size. So you can see this limb hasn't been thinned yet. There's clusters of peaches all throughout it. So we'll actually go through by hand and pull off a majority of these clusters to leave the peaches far enough apart so that they have enough space to grow to full size by harvest. So now we're out here in one of my family's prune orchards. Uh, so as you can tell, this is a little bit different looking from the walnut orchards and the peach orchard that we just visited. So out here, we haven't invested in sprinklers yet. So this is still a flood irrigated orchard. Uh, so the ground is worked up between each irrigation. That's why you can see the dirt clods and the soil is grass free right now. Um, we just irrigated these about two weeks ago. Um, you can also tell there's a lot of open space out here. So this is a pretty old orchard, you know, granted besides the replants here and there. Um, so this orchard was planted further apart. So this is actually nearly 21 foot spacing, which our newest orchard we found is better to keep the trees a little bit shorter. Um, so we actually planted those at about 18 by 16 feet. So per acre, about 50 trees more. Um, that actually helps us not have to grow the trees as big, but produces a higher yield overall per acre. So today we're actually out here machine thinning these peaches, or these prunes. Um, instead of doing them by hand, we simply use our walnut harvesting equipment, our walnut shaker, to grab each tree and sh shake off an approximate number of fruit. Okay, so like I said, we're out here thinning prunes today. It's the same concept as what we saw thinning peaches. So we're trying to make sure that the tree has just enough fruit to, for all of its energy to make nice big prunes that go to market. So instead of by hand, we're out here today thinning with shakers. And so these are actually our walnut shakers that we use during harvest with a few little differences. And so the actual shaking head, the part that grabs the tree, has centrifugal weights in it. So those weights are really heavy for a walnut tree. They shake really hard to bring all the nuts down during harvest. For prunes, we take most of those weights out, except for a little tiny one. So it shakes a lot softer, so that it actually won't shake all of the fruit off of these prune trees. So the guys go through each orchard and use their opinion to decide how long to shake each tree, usually just a few seconds. <laughs> So now we're here at the next step for our prunes. This is where they go directly after harvest. The prunes you saw getting thinned earlier will be harvested about the middle to late August and will come just five miles up the road to this SunSweet dryer. So one of the things I always get asked is what's the difference between a prune and a plum? And really, it's just the time of their life cycle. So right now, technically, these that we saw in the field are plums. So all a prune is, is a dried plum which they come here to actually become a prune. So once they go through that drying process, they end up looking like this, a healthy, full of nutrients, delicious snack. And so all of our plums that we grow on the farm are designed to be prunes. So as we refer to them throughout the year, we just simply call them prunes. So once we harvest in August, the prunes, or prunes come here where they are sorted and then they actually are placed onto these wooden trays we can see here. So to dry this much fruit, it's, it's very similar to a dehydrator that you would have at home. Uh, the fruit is layered onto different racks, as you can see here, in the single layers, and stacked up to go through drying tunnels. Once they are stacked on these multiple trays, they are shifted through a set of rails here in the ground over to one of the multiple drying tunnels here. As you can see, there's probably about 40 tunnels here at this dryer. Uh, SunSweet op opens and operates a, a handful of dryers every harvest where all the prunes in this area are dried. Once they're dried, they go just down the road to Yuba City where they are packaged and shipped to a store near you. So for the last stop of today's field trip, I wanted to bring you guys down to the Feather River. My family's lucky enough to farm in multiple river bottoms along this beautiful river. Unfortunately, I can give you a visual representation of Mother Nature's fury today. We're looking at direct results of the current drought situation we're in. Unfortunately, there's not as much snow falling in the mountains, which results in less water in our reservoirs and less water in our river systems. 
where I'm standing here today on a normal year would be about water up to my waist. As you can see, we're far from that. Unfortunately, we have to deal with what Mother Nature gives us. Over the last couple decades, we've transitioned from pulling water for irrigation out of the river to more sustainable groundwater practices for our ranch. Unfortunately, not every grower is able to do that. So really, I wanna thank everyone for coming on this field trip today. Um, it's been my pleasure to show you guys around, show you the multiple crops we grow, and teach everyone a little bit what it is about how it is to live your life as a farmer. So I'll be live now for any uh, questions you guys may have. Hi, thank you so much for that. Um, giving us a tour of your orchards. We really appreciate it. And of course. we are, we are going to take some questions now. I'm going to start actually with um, that visual, that visual of you at the Feather River, obviously you were used to being waist high in water and it was dry. So on the note of weather, um, how do you cope with weather that is constantly changing? I know this year you guys had frost, but then you also had some high temperatures. So, I mean, are you, what is a grower and a farmer to do? Really, it's just kind of roll with the punches. Um, it's, it's the weather's out of our hands, unfortunately. Uh, if we could, we could control how much rain we get and the temperatures, I mean, every year would just be as easy as can be. Um, so far this year, uh, we had frost right during bloom. Um, luckily, our trees were just far enough along that we didn't have too much damage. Uh, some of the damage we did see were in those peaches, uh, which luckily we thinned, so we can kind of work around those frost damage fruit um, and still have a good crop. Uh, for the water, for the, the variance in temperatures, it's a lot of planning ahead. A lot of looking at the 10 day forecast and saying, okay, it, it's going to be really hot this week. So let's move some of the irrigations up. Let's, um, let's plan on getting some of the, the fertilizers on before it gets too hot. Um, it's really just kind of roll with the punches there. There's a lot of cultural practices you can do in the orchards for like for frost. We can actually run those micro jet sprinklers overnight. And it just the, the heat of the water coming out of the ground will actually warm that orchard just a couple of degrees to, to help the fruit set. Interesting. That is really interesting. I saw a question pop up from Jamie Beck, and this is a great one, so just on the same lines of other climate environment. Was your ranch impacted by the fires of the last two years? Uh, yes, mainly in the way of having to work out in the smoke. Um, luckily, you know, we are down in the valley. So we don't have any fires that, you know, burn right up to our front door. Uh, but just working in the smoke, um, having to deal with having 20, 30 employees in the field breathing air that you shouldn't be breathing. Um, you know, that's one of the good things about having to go through wildfires and the pandemic and everything is we were prepared. We had the PPE, we had masks, you know, and we've kind of become accustomed to it, unfortunately. And that, that, you know, that hurts to say that, but that's kind of the reality of growing in California. As far as the fruit, um, it didn't affect the quality. Um, there is some speculation that because of the overcast caused by the smoke, that the harvest was pushed back a little bit and uh, it took a little longer, but it was, you know, the matter of a couple days. So many different things that the food we eat that we have no idea. Um, I saw another question pop in and it asked about how many family members are involved in your, your family farm and how does, I think they're also asking about like succession planning. Are you hoping that the tradition continues through the years? Um, talk about what generation, I know you mentioned it in the video, but what generation farmer you are, how many far family members work on the farm and what the future looks like for you? Yeah, so I'm the only fourth generation member of the family back on the farm. Uh, I currently farm with my dad and his three younger brothers. Um, and we're kind of the, the five that manage everything, um, you know, make the decisions, uh, get everybody going in the mornings and, uh, you know, manage when we're harvesting, when we're, uh, you know, going to be irrigating, kind of all that, the big, uh, kind of the big picture stuff. Um, so there are some other family members that are still involved in the ag industry and are just, you know, kind of with their own families in different parts of California. So I think in the future, depending on 
you know, when third generation decides to fully um, retire and step back, if they do, uh, my dad says he's going to do it until, uh, you know, he's gone. Um, we'll, uh, you know, I'll probably be the only fourth generation. Wow. Wow. That's a lot to think about, I imagine. Um, we have some other questions coming in to the different commodities you grow. One person asked, um, how many plums are generally on a tree? Yeah, so uh, before thinning, we've, we've counted trees that have, you know, up to 15,000 prunes on them. Um, after thinning, uh, it really kind of depends what the, the market's looking for. Um, obviously, you could grow a lot, thousands, probably six, 7,000 decent sized prunes, but they're not going to be as big as the market kind of dictates they want. Um, so we shoot for between three and 4,000 when we're thinning. Um, and that's on a, you know, a good size, healthy tree. Um, some of the trees, in, you know, on that field trip that we saw uh, in that orchard are, are a little bit older, a little bit smaller, um, you know, and then we'll, we'll shoot for, a, you know, a little less. Wow, that's a lot of fruit. Um, and I'm going to double up some questions. Number one, how do you pollinate your trees? And number two, asking about sterilizing and cleaning plums in the process of drying them. So first, how is pollination done in general? Um, and then how, where does sterilizing and cleaning come in in the process of drying the plums? Yeah, so uh, for pollinization, uh, the prunes are the only ones we grow that actually need uh, bees. And so we put about two hives per acre. So if we had a 10 acre field, we'd have 20 hives out there. Um, and they're out there through the entire, you know, from the beginning of bloom, basically till petal fall. Um, we work really closely with our bee guys so that if there are any insecticide applications done uh, in neighboring fields um, or just, you know, in our general area or in crops next to us that aren't necessarily prunes um, to make sure that their bees are safe. Um, the county does a lot of work with that too during bloom. Uh, the peaches and walnuts are, are just wind pollinated. Um, they used to believe that peaches needed those hives um, to actually have set a good crop load. But over time, you know, in research and studying peaches and the new varieties, um, they've learned that you can get just as much crop load without them. And during peach bloom, most of those hives are in an almond orchard. And so it, 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 that becomes a very busy time of year. So it's not worth the cost to put them out there. You don't really get any yield bump. Uh, and the walnuts are the same way. They used to actually have varieties that um, every 10th tree or so you would plant a different variety of walnut out in that orchard so that it would help pollinate the rest. Um, now we kind of learned and, and as the varieties and the root stocks have gotten better, um, you can just stay with simply one variety. Great. And then that and, other question about the, the cleansing. Yeah, so uh, really, it all starts from just the ground up. So we have, um, you know, very good food safety practices um, as far as, you know, where bathrooms are placed during the year. And this is all out in the field. Um, bathrooms, uh, where lunch breaks are taken, uh, making sure there's no trash, there's no, you know, um, we unfortunately have to deal with dumping a lot from, you know, people just, you know, trying to get rid of stuff in our orchards. Um, so making sure there's that, there's no, um, for example, like, you know, dead animal parts or something that you would find out in nature, um, making sure all that's out of the field, your fruit's clean, making sure the machines are cleaned every day after, after picking all day, that sugar from the prunes will actually build up on some of the sizing chains and belts. So every afternoon, those are cleaned um, to make sure that none of that, you know, gets kind of rancid overnight. Um, once they go to that SunSuite dryer, that's where they are actually washed. Um, the sorting machine, it's actually called the dipper. So it actually dips them through water, rinses them really good, and then they're stacked on the trays before going in the drying tunnel. Excellent. Thank you. I know we have a lot of questions. People are really interested, which is fantastic. Awesome. Yeah, um, that's great. A few more, uh, two that kind of go together. Um, what would happen if the plums or soon to be prunes were just left on the tree to dry? Can they just dry by themselves on the tree? I imagine it would be a much slower process. Um, and then also, when do you ever harvest green plums versus letting them ripen on the tree? Um, so I'll start kind of with your second one. Um, we've never harvested them green. 
um, even when we start harvest, so all, all 500 acres of prunes that we grow are all the same variety. They're all French prunes. So they all basically ripen at the same time. Um, so we test all those orchards, um, looking at sugar content and basically the pressure of, in that prune, um, how much pressure it takes to break the skin. And so when we first start harvest, those prunes actually have like a tint of green to them. So if you see a video, um, I know that we did one with Sac Valley Water and, and a couple of people on that one had asked, well, why are you harvesting them so green? Because they, they did have a little bit of green tint on one side of the fruit. Um, but if you were to taste that, it, it's ripe. It's, it's full of sugar and, and ready to go. Great. And then that other question, what would happen if you just let the fruit dry on the tree naturally? What would that process look like? I imagine it, it would it'd be a much longer and less productive. Yeah, yeah definitely. So uh, in the dryer, those prunes are dried for right around 20 to 21 hours at about 190 degrees. So we would obviously never reach that temperature out in the field. And then in, in late August going into September, those, those fruit will dry on the tree but having those heavy dews at night just invites mold and basically decay um, like any fresh fruit would, you know, mold kind of in your, in your refrigerator if it gets left too long. Um, you definitely run into those issues and, and probably see uh, a lot of food safety issues pop up around that. Um, prunes used to be uh, simply harvested from the field and laid out on, on tarps on the ground and, and dried just by the sunlight. Um, took a lot longer and it was, a, you know, take a lot of labor to do. Absolutely. How long, here's another question, and this may be for somebody that just planted a tree. How long does it take for a tree that is planted um, to produce fruit, either for a farmer like yourself or for somebody like me that, <laughs> that plants it in my backyard? Are they one and the same? And how long is it going to be before I get some fruit? Yeah, so definitely uh, it a fruit tree, peaches, prunes, uh, nectarines, apples, um, kind of all of those, it's, it's really just a couple of years. Um, you're not going to get much. You'll only get, you know, maybe one or two pieces of fruit in the, you know, the second year. Um, it really kind of depends on the, the health and how vigorous that tree is. Um, but also you kind of have to weigh out the fact of, do you want to um, try to get all that fruit, uh, you know, the say 20 pieces of fruit your, your third year, or do you want the tree to get bigger? So in subsequent years, you have more. So um, on a lot of say our peaches uh, for the second and third year, um, right about this time as we're going through, if we're doing any pruning, we'll actually pull those fruit off and just let them recycle back into the soil just to promote the growth from that tree. Um, there's kind of the uh, thought that, you know, you can either um, make some more money your third and fourth year, or you can wait and then your fifth through 12th year, you'll make all that money back plus more, so. Excellent. Um, so we, you, we saw you doing the, the thinning process, and I think that's intriguing. I think a lot of people don't realize that you thin the fruit. How long does it take? Um, do, you, do you only thin it once, or are you continually thinning throughout growing season? And um, how long, let's say, we saw the thinning process? Is that an all-day process? Is it an hour? Obviously, when you thin the plums, prunes, that was a machine, so that's quick. But if you're going by hand, how long does that take? And is the thinning process done more than once? Uh, yeah, so we usually try to go through just once in an orchard, um, but it kind of comes back to your question about weather and mother nature. Um, peaches, for example, when it gets above like 98 degrees um, for a good spell, say a week above 100 degrees, those fruit will tend to just ripen instead of size. And so we'll, we'll sometimes we'll go back into a field that we maybe left on the, the side of heavy, maybe a little too much fruit per tree, but if it was a good year, they would all size. And we'll actually go back through there and pull them off. Usually that's using just like a pole with a, a metal uh, ring on it, just to kind of pull them down. Um, and it's obviously not nearly as many as we pull off this time of year. Um, if everything goes right, we go through just one time and, uh, you know, do the best we can. Um, depending on the orchard and how big the trees are, they can do, um, our crew can do around, I'd say, probably about 20 trees a day is an average. And so that's in about an eight hour workday. Um, for me, I, I'd probably be a lot slower, um, but it, it really takes a lot of skill because you're you're looking at the tree um, you got to kind of 
visualize the whole thing at once. You can't just work inside of a little box because you got to realize if one part of the tree is a little healthier, you can leave a little more fruit. If one branch is a lot weaker, you know, you take a few more off and kind of try to put that whole tree together as one big piece. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, we are going to move on to irrigation. And I think this is a yes. great question. So how often do you irrigate? And I know that depends on the weather and there's a lot that goes into that question, but also I think this is really interesting. How do you prevent root rot when you're irrigating? Yeah, so uh, um, depending on the crop, so walnuts can go and, and depends on kind of where they are too. Uh, walnuts can go three to four weeks without getting subsequent irrigations. Uh, prunes are a little less, two to three weeks, and peaches, we really stay on kind of like a two-week schedule, um, and that's because, you know, like I said in that video, we're, we'll be harvesting those fruit, at, you know, in about a month and a half from now, so those fruit are taking up so much water, and those trees are taking up so much water, um, those trees just dry the ground out so much quicker. Um, some of the walnuts we grow down in the river bottoms, even with the river that low, um, you know, they have roots that go down 20 feet. And so they can actually suck out of the river um, on some of this ground that's uh, further away from the river where you don't have roots that go that far, um, you know, that are only two, three, maybe four feet down in the ground. Um, it dries out a lot quicker. And so we have to keep more water on them. Um, root rot really isn't a problem unless the, the water is warm and it sits on them for a long time. So with those micro jet sprinklers, I mean, within a couple of days of shutting that water off. It, it's muddy, you know, it sticks to your boots when they're running. After we shut it off, you can drive a tractor out there in two or three days and not leave the track. And that's just how quick that ground dries out and how quick those trees are taking up water. Um, we did, uh, you know, when the, the spillway crisis at Lake Orville, uh, you know, in 2017 and um, had a lot of water in our river bottom orchards and actually went through a lot of that root rot because that water set on there, you know, for days, weeks at a time. And you could actually see, um, you know, we lost probably in one of our prune orchards, probably upwards of 30, 40% of our trees out there, just because the water set there, they were trying to bloom at that time. And so they just didn't have any oxygen down there. That is a case, that is a case when root rot was something that you actually experienced during that yeah, really yeah, prime at a, time. Yeah. At yeah. a very um, large scale. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and a question you talked about in the beginning of the video, and that I think this is why somebody asked this, what rootstock do the walnuts graft to? Can you talk about grafting? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it used to be the main one was actually black walnut, um, which you can actually let black walnuts grow um, and use the nuts from them. You know, uh, popular one is black walnut ice cream, um, which my, my grandma used to make all the time. Um, oh, gosh. But, uh, yeah, so most of the trees used to be grafted to black walnuts. Um, they're very hardy. They, they do well with water. Um, they, you know, are disease resistant. Uh, crown gall is one of the, the big diseases that lives in the soil and can really, um, really hurt an orchard, kill trees that are, you know, 10, 15 year old trees that are otherwise completely healthy. Um, so black walnuts resistant against that. The only problem with black walnut rootstock is it actually grows the tree a little smaller. So once you start getting into that, you know, eight year to 20 year mark in a walnut orchard, you know, you can actually see a pretty big difference in black walnut rootstock versus some of the new ones. And a lot of the new ones are actually clonal rootstocks. So they are, um, you know, grown in a lab, basically in uh, test jars, and then grafted over to the tree when the tree is, you know, very small, you know, almost, the, you know, the size of a drinking straw. And uh, those ones grow a lot quicker. Um, some of them are resistant against, say, nematodes, which are basically a little um, insect worm in the soil that attacks the roots. Um, and some of them, you know, do well in different types of soils. So uh, it just kind of depends on what your farm is doing, what your plan is, what your, you know, big picture is on what rootstock you go with. Great. A um, few more questions. And thank you so much yeah. for your time. We really appreciate it, Stephen. No um, how and what type of pesticides do you use? I know that, that that is an issue that obviously mother nature, you have to plan for different things and farmers do use pesticides at certain points. Can you talk about that? Yes, so in a perfect world, we wouldn't use any of them. And I think one of the, the big misconceptions about um, 
how farmers use pesticides and insecticides is that we just go out there and blindly use them. We just, you know, if we see one bug, we um, spray the whole orchard, you know. Um, but right now, and especially kind of as a result of the pandemic and just the global economy is pesticides are incredibly expensive. So that's just another reason if we don't need to use them um, to save our crop, we won't use them. Um, so our pest control plan, basically, um, we, we follow integrated pest management plans. So we uh, have a professional and his assistant that scout all of our fields every week. Um, and they monitor all kinds of insect populations. So coddling moth or oriental fruit moth in the, the fruit. Um, they're constantly looking those, trapping, um, you know, and kind of estimating in the future of like, okay, and I think in three weeks we'll have a population that needs to be addressed. And it'll be about the right time in that moth's life cycle to, um, to apply the pesticide that, that'll work the best. Um, I kind of mentioned, you know, during pollination and when there's a lot of beehives in the area, um, there's certain cutoff dates where you're not allowed to use certain insecticides after a certain day to protect the bees. Um, everyone that purchases these chemicals has to go to continuing education classes, has to hold specific licenses. Um, we have to get recommendations from people that hold other licenses to advise on the use of that. So there, there's a lot of hoops we jump through and we only use them when we really need to. And a lot of the chemicals we use now are, are very specific for what pest we're going after so that it doesn't hurt, say, your beneficial insects, your, you know, um, your wildlife, or just, you know, uh, doesn't stay in the fruit nearly as long. Excellent. Thank you for clarifying and explaining that subject matter. Yeah. It's really, really helpful. Somebody asked, and I want to know this answer too. Paula asked, um, do you get fruit loss due to birds? I mean, are birds coming down and eating your fruit? And how, as a commercial farmer, do you, how do you control that? Yeah, um, some of the peaches that will actually get a lot of orange color, um, different varieties kind of ripen up different. Some of the ones will ripen on the outside and turn a really bright orange about a week before you harvest. And, and we can get hit pretty hard with birds out there. Um, we have, most of the time what we do is simply just uh, put up colorful reflective ribbons, you know, on say every fifth tree. And, and that seems to keep it down to a level that we're okay with. You're, you're gonna experience a little bit and really uh, a peach that has a little tiny bird peck in it, um, is still a good peach, you know, it's just a little nick as if you, you know, you dropped it on the counter and made a little nick on, on your, your cutting board. Um, so we actually, uh, those will be cut off at the cannery, the little bird pecks, you know, and as long as it's not above a certain level or a certain amount of damage on an individual peach, um, we can still use those. Um, there's also other methods. Uh, there's uh, an item called a Zon gun, which is basically a, a propane uh, sound maker. And so sometimes you'll hear that, you know, boom, every 30 seconds, every five minutes, you know, out in the orchard. And that's just simply to kind of scare the birds off every couple of minutes. Uh, um, unfortunately, you know, those kind of can disrupt the neighborhood if you're farming near, uh, near town. Um, and also, you know, they can just be uh, expensive with propane prices to run and everything. And you are talking to teachers right now um, to wrap this up. What is something that you would like teachers to relay about farmers? You have boots on the ground, you're in a farming family, you're hoping to continue with the tradition. Why is it important for teachers to bring agriculture into their classrooms? Yeah, and, and first off, I, I really want to say thank you to all the teachers out here that are taking a time out of their Saturday to learn more about, you know, farming. Um, farming is something we're always going to have to do. It, it's not going to... Um, go away. We're always going to need to be able to eat, um, be able to have a safe and, you know, full food supply. Um, so I really thank you for that. I really um, want to spread awareness about what we do. Um, there's with the internet and everything, you know, it's, it's easy to see bad things or to, to read bad things about farming, to read things that um, are jaded in a way to make us look like we don't care. Um, I would 100% eat any of the fruit we grow, um, would feed it to anyone I care about. Like, like we, we do the best we can. We try to be safe with everything. We 
we're just, you know, we're, we're people, we're just like anybody, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can. Um, we're trying to grow good food and we really just need to further educate children, uh, adults, everyone about agriculture, because when it comes to voting, when it comes to um, being open to helping farmers in your community um, to understand why your food prices might vary, um, you know, and then just buying, buying California food, buying, you know, food grown in the United States. Uh, um, it all starts with education. So I just, I really think it's just important to um, bring awareness and just anything somebody can learn about any of the crops we grow. I, I think it's good. Wonderful.